Hey, if you have a Bible, Acts chapter 2, Acts 2 if you have a Bible. Um, have you ever had a revolutionary idea, an idea that came into your mind and you thought to yourself like this, this could really go somewhere. I think people would actually pay real money for something like this. Have you ever had an idea for a startup, a passion project, or a business, and your idea was loaded with potential and possibility? Uh, I have. Years ago, I had a brilliant idea. It was, it was incredible uh, for a startup company, and um, honestly, it went really well. I made more money than I had ever seen up until that point in my life, and uh, I was pretty good at it. Um, the only problem was I was nine. Um, so growing up, Growing up, my mom ran a seafood restaurant on the east coast of Canada in Prince Edward Island. And um, people would travel from all over in the summer to visit her seafood restaurant, have a seafood experience. And uh, it was really great. Like people would have lobster and scallops and chowder, like the whole deal. But the best part of her restaurant was the dessert. And uh, the dessert was, wait for it, it was made from seaweed. But trust me, it was really really good. Uh, it was ca called Irish Moss Limage, and um, I had a brilliant idea that I would go out and I would harvest a bunch of Irish moss. I would dry it, package it, and sell it with the recipe. And so you can probably imagine as people would roll into this fine establishment to have, you know, dinner, that they would see this local strange boy standing outside trying to sell seaweed. And I got a lot of strange looks uh, I got a lot of like weird comments, like what is this, you know, weird local boy doing in his rubber boots selling seaweed outside of a restaurant? Um, but as they walked out of the restaurant, on their way out, they were practically throwing their money at me. It was a huge, huge success. I hate to admit it, and you probably know this by now, but the success was very short-lived. I didn't make Fortune 500. I wasn't one of the most successful startups of that year, and I didn't change the world. But deep down, I think that we all within want to change the world. We want to make a difference. We want to leave our mark on the world and leave it somehow in a better condition than how we found it. And you know what? That is something that I love about our generation. The desire to change the world, the desire to make an impact, to leave a lasting legacy. But what if the world isn't changed by innovation, creative ideas, and startup companies? What if Fyodor Dostoevsky was right when he said that the world would be saved by beauty? See, the first Christians that we read about in church history dramatically changed the world as they knew it. How did this happen? How did they change the world? How did they drastically change the Roman Empire in, in a, a pagan society that was opposed to the way of Jesus? How did they do it? Well, we find, we find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is what it says. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many signs and wonders performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, the, the first Christians drastically and dramatically changed the world that they were living in. They, they completely subverted the Roman culture that they found themselves living in and completely changed it. But what was their secret? How did they do this? What was the thing that they did or embodied to change the world? I would submit to you, it was their way of life. It's what we see in Acts 2.42 when it says they were devoted to one another and to a way of life. And maybe you're sitting here critically thinking, and I don't blame you, this is how I think too, like you're telling me that they changed the world through a way of life, through sharing, you know, meals with one another and praying, really, that's how they did it? You know, I'll admit, none of these things are revolutionary. They didn't, you know, start a protest or start a campaign or, or do something dramatic, but yet they changed the world. And I believe that they changed the world because they were devoted to something beautiful, a way of life. Joseph Hellerman writes this, people, speaking of the, the first three centuries of Christianity, people did not convert to Christianity solely because of what the early Christians believed. 
They converted because of the way in which the early Christians behaved. See, the ancient Christians were known, publicly known, for their love for one another. They were known for their way of life. You know, I, I would say this is true of me, and I think this is true of our society, but we think if we're going to change the world, we've got to do something dramatic, something big, something that's going to get everyone's attention. But the first Christians ate together and tried to the best of their ability to live like Jesus. And the church exploded in growth. Um, a few authors like Rodney Stark point out that within the first um, couple hundred years of the church history, it exploded in growth to grow to about five or six million people living within the Roman Empire. I mean, this is just like catastrophic growth. And, and in fact, the emperor of the time, um, Emperor Julian, wrote this. The Galileans, and, and when he uses that term, he's speaking of the Christians. The Galileans begin with their so-called love feast, as we did this morning. And the result is that they have led very many into atheism. That was his critical way of speaking about Christianity. So apparently, according to the Roman Empire emperor of the time, the church exploded in growth due to a few potlucks. Their family dinners and way of life led millions within the Roman Empire to convert to Christianity. He goes on to say their benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and the holiness of their lives have done most to increase atheism. See, the church grew to five or six million people within the first couple hundred years of the church history because of the way that they lived. It was the beauty of their lives. It was their way of life. They actually became people who lived and loved like Jesus. See, they won over the Roman Empire by the way that they followed Jesus together. The early church was marked by their way of life, and they were known for it. Here's what Tim Keller, who just passed away on Friday, said about the early church. He said the early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everybody their body. And the Christians came along and gave practically nobody their body and gave practically everybody their money. See, according to Tim Keller, one of the most radical things that we can do in our day is to be generous with our, our money and live wholly in accordance to purity. This is one of the most culturally subversive things we can do. And it's what the early church did. And like the early church, we can have a profound impact on our society simply by living different. See, the world, I believe, is dying for someone to give them a better way for being human in the world. Around 150 AD, a Christian by the name of Justin Martyr described this new Christian community in these words. He says, we who formerly hated and murdered one another now live together and share the same table. See, in, in those days, you didn't eat with people that were different than you. You, you ate with people that were not your enemies and definitely not people who are beneath you. You ate with people who are your race, your gender, your social class, your religion. You ate with your tribe. So you only ate with people who looked like you and thought like you and voted like you and acted like you. But at this table, according to Justin Martyr and, and the, the early Christians, there is no longer slave or free, man or woman, Jew or Gentile. There is at this table no longer poor or rich, tax collector or zealot, sinner or saint, in or out. At the table of Jesus, all are invited as equals. See, the breaking of bread in the first century was a radical social demonstration. When the church broke bread, they were declaring to the social structures of their world that there's a different way of being human in the world. This demonstration was a beautiful proclamation that all are welcome to follow Jesus. See, their way of life was beautiful, and it was the beauty that people were longing for. I believe it was a prophetic witness to the watching world. There was people like Gregory of Nyssa who called the church to do things like abolish slavery. There were people like Basil of Caesarea who led the way for uh, inventing things like welfare and public hospitals. John Dixon, in his book, Bullies and Saints, writes that, quote, there was no such thing as free medical care available for all until Basil the Great. See, the early church was known for their way of life. This is what Jesus meant when he said, the world will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. This is what we want to be known for as a church, our way of life. We want to be known for the way that we follow Jesus and actually live out his teaching. This is 
what they said about Jesus' disciples, James and John. James and John were just a couple of nobodies. There were a couple of young, you know, dropouts and a, a couple of young fishermen who notably in Acts 4 says that they were uneducated. But this is what they say in verse 13. It says that they could see that they had been with Jesus. Poor Kel's church, does the world look at you and say, there's something different about you. There's something beautiful, compelling about you. And it's the fact that you've been with Jesus. Are you marked by his way of life? Has his teaching got all the way down from your head into your heart and into your life? See, I wonder what would happen in our, if our day, if people could tell that we had been with Jesus. I wonder what would happen if we devoted ourselves, as radical of a claim this is, to the lifestyle of Jesus. We actually embodied his way of life. In fact, this is what it means to be a disciple. The word mathetes in the Greek language literally connotes this idea. See, at its core, discipleship was about being with and becoming like your rabbi. Jesus said in Luke 40, the student or disciple is not above their teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher or rabbi. See, the goal of a disciple is to be with and become like your rabbi. And as disciples of Jesus, our goal is to be with and become like Jesus. This is why the disciple of Jesus, John writes in 1 John 2, 6, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. In other words, to follow Jesus is to adopt his way of life. This is what the early church did. When, the, when Acts 2 says they devoted themselves, it means they devoted themselves, number one, to each other, and number two, to a way of life. Prayer, uh, spiritual gifts, meeting together, breaking bread, caring for the poor, these were the things and characteristics that made up the way of life for the early Christians. And here at Port, Port Kells, we're going to call this a way of life. Uh, in the monastic tradition, it's more uh, popularly known as a rule of life. Pete Gregg uh, defines a rule of life as, quote, a set of principles and practices that we build into the rhythm of our daily lives, helping us deepen our relationship with God and serve him more faithfully. A rule is how we seek to live out that faith day to day as disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit. Another author, Rod Dreer, writes that for the early monastics, a rule was simply a guide to living in Christian community. See, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine, speaking of, of the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. A rule of life or way of life is simply a way as, as we as a community put the words of Jesus into practice. See, one of the most common criticisms of people outside of the church today is that they like Jesus. Maybe they like Jesus a lot, but they don't like the church very much. In other words, they find Jesus compelling and beautiful, but they are put off by those who claim to follow Jesus, but do not live like Jesus. See, it needs to be said, to follow Jesus is to adopt his way of life. James K.A. Smith, a philosopher at Calvin college tells a story in his book, Imagining the Kingdom, of a guy named Alex, who practiced the weekly um, uh, practice of confession, which is something pretty much non-existent in the Protestant church in the West. Um, and each week, Alex would go to church, and part of the, the liturgy rhythm was that they would confess sin before they went to the table. And James Smith writes this, he would never realize how formative this seemingly dull and repeated practice was until years later. In the dark evening of a January night, Alex and his wife would receive a call. Their teenage son was in trouble. Derailed by depression and anxiety, he had spiraled into behaviors that were part defiance and part cries for help. Now Alex was receiving a call that he had never been trained for. Upon sight, uh, um, upon sight Alex, his son collapsed and grabs, grabbed him around his waist like he had as a child. Amid the tears and heaves of his sobs, Alex heard his son blurber, I'm so sorry, Dad. Please forgive me. Alex himself had spent a lifetime confessing his sins to a gracious father. So without hesitation and without even having to think about it, Alex just knew what to say and what to do. So he gathered up his son into his arms and whispered, of course I forgive you. The regularity and repetition of the practice of confession had already taught him on a gut level that he too was a prodigal son who regularly approached his father 
asking for forgiveness again and again. Through his regular and repeated practice of confession, Alex had absorbed the temperament of our gracious Heavenly Father. And then James um, ends with these words, if Christian worship is to be formative, it has to be repetitive. See, a rule or way of life is the way in which, as a community, we put the teachings of Jesus into practice in a rhythmic and repetitive way. We order our lives habitually around the life and teaching of Jesus until it forms us through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, what we do, in other words, is we practice today what is difficult so that tomorrow it becomes second nature. See, because under pressure, as the saying goes, you do not rise to the occasion, but you fall back on your training. This is why we train young pilots to fly not in the cockpit of a real plane, but behind a simulator, because you always fall back on your training. See, Rod Dreher says that the purpose of a rule of life is to, quote, train your heart and spirit so that when you need it, when you don't feel strong enough to will yourself to get through that difficult moment, you fall back on your training. See, a rule or way of life is how we, quote, train ourselves for godliness in the words of Paul in 1 Timothy 4, 8. See, Jesus' last command to his church was to go and make disciples of all nations. But simply what we do in the West is we think that what that means is that we go and tell people to believe a list of ideas, a set of doctrines, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, go make disciples, teaching them to observe or live all that I have commanded. He actually expected us to put it into practice or to live the lifestyle in which he lived. See, if we today are going to change the world, we need to stop trying to be normal. We need to stop trying to make it our ambition to to be like everybody else in Surrey and in Langley and and the surrounding areas. Our goal cannot, as Christians, be to try to be normal. Instead, We must win the world like the first Christians did through beauty, by our way of life. And we do this by adopting thought patterns and behaviors that aren't normal or natural to us. And as we do this repeatedly and rhythmically, we are formed into the image of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. A few weeks ago, Ben and I were in Hamilton, Ontario, or the Hammer as they call it there. And uh, as we're in Ontario, we're hanging out with uh, Matt Paplin, who some of you met. And I was sitting in Matt Paplin's um, living room and he was sharing with me about his community of St. Clair. And he was telling me of how uh, when they they started in the early days, there was a few key families who all decided to buy homes on the same street and to do a type of communal living. And they would live out a way of life in their neighborhood for the sake of the neighborhood. Their, Their vision came from Isaiah 58, where it talks about you know, how God will, will create a people living in exile who will build communities and, and cause the city to flourish. And so I asked him, why did you guys choose to sacrifice so much? Why did you guys devote yourself to such a, a, an incredibly radical way of life? And he looked at me and he said, Dan, we realize that if we do this for the next 20 years, our kids will know no different. I believe that's what the next generation needs. It's what our kids need. It's what our grandkids need. They need to see our faith, not just in our heads, but lived out in the context of our lives in community. I believe Fort Kells Church, one of the most prophetic and radical things that we can do for the next generation is simply live out our faith together as a family. That's what our kids need. They don't need to just look to other people and say, I get that you understand it, but do you live it? So here at Port Kells Church, we want to follow Jesus together as family. What if we follow Jesus together as a family for the next 20 years and our kids knew no different? Again, to quote Fyodor Dostoevsky, the world will be saved by beauty. And so this fall, we will be launching our communities, as Ben said, and we'll be gathering weekly um, in, in homes around a table. And as we do do this, we will be devoting ourselves to a way of life or the way of life of Jesus. Here's an example of our way of life as it stands right now. You'll notice the first one on there is scripture. Our desire is to be people formed by the word of God, but our our desire is also to to know God better through his word. You'll also see that we put um, the practice of Sabbath on there and you're like, oh man, I've never done Sabbath. That's one of the 10 commandments practiced in the early church. Um, 
yeah, you, you guys will practice it. It's a literal 24-hour period commanded by God, um, given to us as a gift to rest and delight in God's presence. Uh, our third practice is around generosity. This can look a, a few different ways. Uh, this can mean the practice of simplicity, which is uh, living below your means for the sake of others. But it also includes things like giving, which we will practice every time we gather. See, these, these practices, we hope, will be the way that we embody the lifestyle of Jesus. This is the way in which, as a community, we will become disciples or apprentices of our master rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth. We will practice things like loving our neighbor, pr- joining God in the renewal of all things, fasting, um, Spiritual gifts are on there as well and more. See, we're choosing to adopt a way of life so that we can rhythmically and repeatedly put the words of Jesus into practice. And as we do this together, we embody the life of Jesus and are formed into his likeness. Years ago, there was a, there was a pa- pastor who um, went to the barber to get his hair cut. As he's sitting in the barber chair, his barber is literally just like, tearing apart the church as you do, right? All the hypocrisy and legalism and, you know, the crusade, whatever thing, thing you could do, it's just like throwing all the stones at the church, right? And there's many to throw, okay? Um, and the pastor just sat there for like 20 minutes, just listening to his barber criticize the church for all of her hypocrisy and brokenness. And after he was done criticizing the church, the pastor responded by saying, what is your idea of a perfect world? And a bit stunned by the question, the, the barber, you know, took a, thought, a minute to, to collect his thoughts. And he said, well, I guess it would be a world without pain and suffering, a world without violence and evil. And the pastor looked at his barber and said, that is why the church exists. Uh, the barber actually went to church with him the next week. But let me, I say that to say this, will we exist? Will we be a church that exists for the renewal of all things? Will we model a different way of being in the world? The great Swiss theologian Karl Barth said, the church exists to set up in the world a new sign which is radically dissimilar to the world's own manner and which contradicts it in a way that is full of promise. Friends, if that is true, our lives must contradict the way of the world in a way that is, quote, full of promise and beauty. So here's my point this morning. Here's my charge to us as a church. I believe the world is looking for beauty. I believe the world around us is looking for a different way of being human in the world. So what if we embodied a different way, an ancient way of being human? What if we patterned our way of life after Jesus of Nazareth? Let's pray. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And you've come that we might have life and life to the full. But you also said that, that when we are fully trained, we will become like you. And so God, we pray that we would come and actually follow after you. We would follow your way of life. And so God, I pray that you would lead us as a community to embody who you are, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. So come Holy Spirit and embody us, God. Come and fill us afresh. We pray this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.